Hello and welcome to a new video series called Project Roscoe. In this video series, we're going to design and build a 68030 based computer. And when I say design, I mean we're going to design the logic, the physical PCB, all the circuitry, physically build and assemble it, and hopefully end up with a running computer. Uh, the real driver behind doing this project was that a friend of mine, Neil, called me and asked if I was interested in building a 68030 based computer because he was wanting to try doing a Linux port, so taking Linux and getting it to run an architecture, and more importantly, to get some experimentation with things like UEFI and how it boots and loads and things like peripheral mapping. And so he said, do I build one? And we had built a 68000 based computer last fall. And so I said, sure, that sounds fantastic. So in this video series, we are going to design this computer and then hopefully construct it and end up with a working computer. So the 68030 is the fourth of the 68,000 family of processors, starting with the 68,000, then this is 68, 10, 20, and 30. After that came the 40, and then eventually the 60. The 30 is a somewhat special chip in that family. It was the first in that family to have a memory management unit in the chip. And so from the 68020, they added in both the MMU and also a small instruction and a small data cache. And the MMU is really important because it makes it possible to bring in uh, a multi-user operating system like Linux or a number of other operating systems. And so it really makes it possible to do sort of more advanced stuff than you could with the 6020 or the previous parts of that family. It was somewhat famously used in, it's been used in a bunch of machines. You might remember it from the Macintosh 2 series. It was in the 2FX as an example which was a great machine. It was a 40 megahertz version. I actually have one sitting over there. And it was sort of the pinnacle of the two series in the Macintosh world. It also was used in the SE30, which is a, probably the fastest of the little small case Macs. Uh, so just a great machine. It was also used in the Next Cube. So the very first Next Cube had a 68030. And perhaps maybe most famously in the Amiga, in the Amiga 3000 and a few other Amigas. Um, and it's still used as an accelerator card for older Amigas. And it was also used in the Sun 3 series as well. So lots of use in the sort of 80, late 80s to early 90s. The first chip came out in 87. Um, and it was sort of a force to be reckoned with when it came out. It was a fantastic chip. So we're going to build something using that chip. Now, it's a chip from the late 80s. So the first question you're going to ask is, well, can you get them? And you can't order them from DigiKey. But they're pretty easy to find. So on eBay, there's a lot of them for sale something in the 20 to $50 range typically. So you can easily get one. They come in like, this is the gold package. Right, here's one in the plastic package. And man, another one in the gold package. So they're relatively easy to get somewhere between 16 and 40 megahertz. Uh, I have one, let's switch over here. I have one sitting here. So this is a 33 megahertz plastic version. Uh, and Phoenix Enterprises actually sells the socket still. And so this is a PGA 13 by 13 socket. Um, and you can tell this is probably was meant for the 6830 because it has these little extra pins here, which on the original gold package versions are non-connect pins. On uh, the newer plastic case versions, those pins are just left off. So this probably was a uh, socket meant for the 6830. So we have the, the processor and then the socket, so it's pretty easy to put into a motherboard. Uh, you can put a heat sink on these to cool them. It isn't necessarily re required, but it could be if you run it uh, overclocked. But they are available, and so that's a great thing about building this computer is you can still buy the CPU. Now, this CPU does not have a floating point unit in it. The 040, the later one, does. And the floating point unit is sort of super helpful these days. So we are also going to include in our design a 68882, which was a math coprocessor designed to work alongside the 68030. These are fortunately relatively available. There's on eBay, you can see them here. They come in both a PGA package and a PLCC. We're gonna use the PLCC version because that was used on a bunch of different motherboards, a lot of the Amigas, um, and so there's a lot of those out there. And so you can see they're relatively inexpensive. I think the only gotcha with these is that sometimes the ones you see on eBay like this one's marked as a 40 megahertz. Sometimes they're ones that have been remarked. So they're actually a 25 megahertz certified part remarked as a higher speed part. Uh, that seems to happen with this part more than others. Part of the reason is because these parts are relatively overclockable. So a lot of the 25 and 33s 
will run at 40 megahertz. And so they probably get away with remarking them because they end up working. Uh, so if you buy one, keep in mind that if you buy a 40, it may actually not be a 40. Uh, but they are available. There's lots of them out there and they're relatively inexpensive. It's an easy socket to design around. Uh, and so we will include that in our design. So in the next video, we're gonna dig into the 68030 in particular and talk about some of the cool features and mostly about the bus and how it interfaces with things. But before we get to that, we'll kind of talk about, well, what are we actually going to build? What will this computer look like? And so let's take a look at what we're gonna build. Let's talk about what this computer is going to look like. We're gonna start with physically. We're gonna build this in an ATX form factor. So we're gonna make it the board itself an ATX dimension. That means it'll have you know certain locations for mounting holes and there'll be a particular location for things like expansion slots and the little IO area that's common in an ATX board. And the benefit is that you can then just buy a normal ATX case and this will fit in there perfectly. We're also gonna use an ATX power supply connector so that you can use an ATX power supply, which will give us a good five volt and 3.3 volt input. Uh, so we have kind of the physical form factor. We know what we're gonna use for the CPU and for the FPU. So then the question is, well, what else do we need to make this a uh, usable computer? So the first thing is we need some memory and we're gonna start by putting on this board some static RAM. And so this is an SRAM and we're gonna put on four megabytes of SRAM. And in particular, this is gonna be 10 nanosecond SRAM. So pretty fast SRAM. And the reason for the SRAM is both because it's fast and because it will always work. Because we're also going to do DRAM. So we're gonna have some DRAM on the board and we're going to use the old school 72 pin SIM memory modules. These are really readily available. They were used in a ton of computers. The SIMs themselves come in sizes from one megabyte up to a maximum of 128 uh, megabytes per SIM. And we're gonna do four SIM slots. So that'll give us up to 512 megabytes of uh, DRAM memory. And part of the reason for having the SRAM, and so this will be hooked to the CPU as will the DRAM, but part of the reason for having the SRAM is that the DRAM requires a couple of things. It requires some additional circuitry to mux the address bits. And more importantly is that it requires refresh. So we've got to build some logic into the board to handle the refresh. Dynamic RAM needs a cycle where occasionally you read from sequential rows and eventually you're reading from all of the rows over some period of time to keep the memory from losing the data that it's storing. And that requires some circuitry. And so for us to do that, it's nice to have a system that can boot and run with SRAM first, because then we can debug and figure out the refresh circuitry and make sure we get it correct and do things like some memory tests, like a long-term running memory test to verify everything works. You know, the DRAM is also a little more sensitive to noise. It's got a signal called RAS and another one called CAS. And these signals are somewhat noise sensitive because they're very sensitive to where the edges occur relative to each other. So it's just a good thing to have it have SRAM as a way to get the machine working and then we can kind of debug that DRAM interface. We could eventually make a system without it, but there was one other cool thing about the SRAM. The 68030, its external bus has several different ways of addressing memory and objects. It has a method that's called the asynchronous and one called synchronous. And in particular, it supports a synchronous model that is only two clock cycles to access stuff. And if we use that for the SRAM, it's very fast. And the DRAM isn't fast enough to do that kind of transfer. So we'll likely use a asynchronous, it's at least three cycles, and maybe it could be four cycles, depending on the, the DRAM speed. So having the SRAM also gives you some very fast memory. And that comes in handy because I mentioned before, there is an MMU here in the 68030. And the memory management unit is what allows you to map between 
uh, virtual memory on one side and physical memory on the other. But it does that with things called page tables, which are these tables of memory that do this mapping. And so in our design, we could keep those page tables in this SRAM. And that has the advantage that the page table loads will be very fast because they're coming out of the fastest memory we could ever do, which is this two cycle synchronous. Uh, and since that gets used a lot of examples and you access a page that isn't in the, the, the CPU's version and has to do a page fault and read in some page tables, so having that be fast is a huge advantage. So having fast static RAM is easy to do. And, and nowadays this RAM is relatively inexpensive compared to what it was in the 80s. So it'll make for sort of the maximum performance we can get from a 6830. So memory, that's pretty obvious. Those are things we have to have. Um, what else do we need? Well, we probably need some type of what I'll call a PTC, a programmable timer counter, which is really just a device that can do an interrupt at some fixed interval, maybe every 10 milliseconds or something configurable. And that's really critical because you need a timer interrupt source to do context switches in the OS, which all depend on some type of uh, repeatable periodic interrupt at a timer value, something similar to this. So we want some type of device that can do that. Um, we also want to have a real time clock. This is simple, it's just a little chip that has an onboard battery that uh, allows you to know the date and time, so you don't have to enter every time it boots. And you know, these chips, we're probably gonna use one from uh, Dallas. They often have in them a little block of memory, a little bit of, they call it NVRAM, non-volatile RAM. And in the like old PC world, this is what you would generally call, you might call it a CMOS memory. Um, and it's used to store things like variables for booting the machine, maybe the number of wait states for a given device and some other configuration. And that can be written to and then read from, and it always gets saved inside of the RTC. So it's a nice thing to have um, in a computer design that you're gonna do. Of course, we want this computer to be able to actually talk to the world. If it's running Linux, it's gotta have, um, you know, so, some way for the external world to know that it's there. So we are gonna put on the main board some UARTs. And we'll do a two, a double UART, so there'll be two serial ports, so serial one and serial two. Um, and that'll allow you to talk to the outside world. You could have it be a console port to maybe a, a debug port. So having a UART is a great way to get it started. It's probably one of the first peripherals you'd want to get uh, working. Um, we, you know, since we're going to support Linux, we're going to need some type of uh, fixed media support. So we are going to include an IDE interface. And actually we're going to include two of them. So there'll be two complete IDE interfaces. Each one can then reference uh, two devices. So you get a total of uh, four IDE devices. Uh, IDE is a really easy thing to build into a system because the IDE itself is really just a few buffers. There's not really a lot of logic to it. Um, and there's one other cool thing about IDE I think that's worth mentioning. Let's pop over here Oop, uh, to the top cam. So one cool thing about IDE is the compact flashcard. So the compact flashcard you can buy these little boards that are adapters, so you can take a compact flash card and then adapt it to the regular IDE pinout. Uh, and the reason that works is because the compact flash card itself actually uses the ATA slash IDE protocol as the interface. So this is really just a wiring adapter um, that also supports uh, a little power connector for a 3.5 inch floppy drive power. So these just plug right in and appear as ID drive, 16 gigabytes. So super easy to put something on. You can provide power actually over the ID connector on pin 20, which is the, it's called the key pin. So on some ID interfaces, you'll see the pin not exist on the motherboard side and then the cables will have a little blocker. So you can't insert this backwards, but it's kind of a uh, somewhat standard to put five volt power over that pin. And so we'll do that in our design and this, adapter has a little jumper here, you can jumper to get power from pin 20. And then this, this will plug directly into the motherboard and you'll have a, a virtual hard drive, or a real hard drive, not a virtual. Uh, the other cool thing is that it's compact flash, so you can take it out and you can put it in a compact flash reader that plugs into USB. And that's awesome because you could mount this file system if it's Linux and copy files over to it. So it makes it a really cool way for your own 
homebrew computer to have storage and storage that's easy to uh, read and write from from another computer. So a great thing to do, ID interfaces are super easy. And so we're definitely going to do one of those. So since this is gonna be a, you know, a Linux based computer, there are a couple other sort of obvious things you need. So we definitely need some type of LAN interface. So an ethernet interface of some kind that gives us some IP networking. Um, we're probably gonna need some way to attach a keyboard to it. And we could do the old school 8242 controller, but there are some really cool single chip USB solutions. Um, Microchip has one called the VNC that is just a very simple to use. Um, has a nice parallel interface that's very compatible with the normal CPU. And then gives you two USB ports for something like a keyboard and a mouse. And this is, you know, USB 2, so it's not for super high speed transfer, but for a 60 to a 30, it'll be fantastic. And then we can use a USB keyboard and a USB mouse, which will be uh, super easy to do. Now, of course, this computer has to turn on, so we are going to need uh, some type of flash. And so we're going to put on here a flash memory, and we're going to use those um, 39SF, which is the, it's a NOR flash chip. It comes in a dip package. so you can put it in a nice socket and you can pull it off and flash it. And this is like a 512K uh, flash chip. And so we can use that as sort of the bootloader and what you might really call the BIOS. Uh, one other thing we're gonna add is we're gonna put on another bigger flash memory. And so this will also be flash. This is not removable, but it'll be a 64 megabyte flash. And this is primarily designed so that we can use it for like a UEFI partition um, and have all that stored on board in a flash and not have to load it from the, the disk every time. And so oh, one last thing I'll mention is we are gonna do a little microcontroller, like a little AT uh, tiny, AT tiny, maybe a 24A to do the ATX interface. And what I mean by that is that to control the power supply and provide a little signal to the CPU. And that's really for two things. One is so we can have uh, soft power down. So there can be a little power button here that you hit when you wanna power down the uh, system. And it can send a note to the computer and to the CPU saying, hey, we wanna power down and let it do a sync of disk and all that stuff. And then the CPU can reply back and say, okay, we're good to go turn the power off. And it also enables the reverse direction, which is the CPU. You can have a menu item called shutdown and it can do its own self shutdown. So having that little controller is an easy thing to do to make it possible to use an ATX power supply um, and have it interface in a way that works well. And then maybe the last thing I should mention is we are gonna do um, an expansion port. Since it's an ATX style board, you know, there's gonna be a space on the board for where you would normally put either PCI or ISA like cards. And so we're gonna do uh, an expansion port to allow us most importantly to put in here a video card. And the video card we're going to design in a second video series. And there's, we're gonna design a couple different VGA versions, um, but you also could use this to add memory. So it'll be a fully capable expansion port, full 32 bit access to all the space. So you could add other peripherals, maybe a faster LAN, or um, some other type of adapter of some kind. So this is sort of what we're gonna build in this video series and it's gonna be awesome. So stay tuned, next video we'll talk about the O30 and kind of dig into the bus architecture. And then we're gonna start iterating through each of these systems and figure out how to build them, select the parts uh, and design them.